Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fosco here for another episode of the show. And the first episode using the green screen. Green screen on? Or green screen off? Green screen on. Alright. Um, so, I should have a background here. Uh, my screen tests worked out pretty well, which I did one screen test and uh, it worked so well it's like I don't need to do any more. So, um, I have no idea what's behind me. It might be what I used for my first screen test, which was uh, the estuary, the, the uh, Gironde estuary, uh, looking from Poyac over to Blaine. Um, I have no idea what's going on. It might be just black, which might be what I normally do, is just a black background, maybe have the logo off to the side. I'm not really sure how I'm going to do it, but even just the black background made things look a lot better. Hopefully nothing is shining through. Um, we can talk about green screen for a little bit. Um, it's, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's the technology they use to put actors in front of you know, virtual sets, which is hopefully what I'm in front of. Um, the, you tell the computer that there's a color of green behind you or somewhere, could, I could be wearing it or whatever, and to just eliminate that color from the scene. Um, that's the basic idea. The reality is, um, when you saw that brief instant where I turned off the key, which is called keying, you saw the green screen, but you saw, um, and I'm going to have some pictures here of, of the set I took from, the, from my camera, not from my cell phone, just to get better pictures. Um, but the green, I don't know why I'm looking back there, <laughs> I can't see anything. The green is uh, different colors to the computer. For us it's different brightnesses, I mean technically they are different hues or different colors, but the computer sees multitude of colors there, so you have to tell it, well this is the one color I want you to base everything off of. Uh, and then, if everything's lit properly, it's all the same color. If it's not lit properly, then it's too much of a variation and then you have some issues. Uh, this will be the same thing I'm going to use when I do live stuff, so I'll be using Cam Twist. That one didn't work as well as Final Cut. Final Cut, is, it's beautiful. You just say key and it goes, it goes see ya, it goes away. Um, with, uh, with everything else, um, you keep seeing me sit back. If you see me sit back, I get a little more lit. I've got a couple lights on either side that you probably saw already in the pictures. Um, so those light me up a little bit. They're not they're not supposed to. They're really supposed to be kind of behind me, but the green screen is too close to me. Uh, green screen should be at least six feet, and it's about five feet behind me. Um, so the lights should be actually a little should be actually behind me so they don't light me up. But I didn't mind the effect because especially if I use, was using an outdoor scene, it kind of made it a little more realistic that I was outdoors. This isn't Hollywood, so I'm not expecting perfection, but uh, it is it is pretty cool. All right, so now let's now that I rambled on plenty with that, oh, I forgot to start the timer anyway. So let's see, that's what time it is. All right, yeah, whatever. All right, so let's get started with some wine. All right, uh, I'm going to do a few reviews today, and then uh, then I get to go to a party tonight, sales by five. All right, um, for 10 year anniversary, March 1st, uh, pretty cool stuff. All right, so let's, uh, and this should be the, the left boundary of everything. I mean, it extends, extends more in a, a line, but uh, so I know that this is as far as I can go. All right, um, wine, let's get right into it. So things have been rearranged a little bit. Um, because hopefully I have a little bit of space over here I can have pictures and I've moved over this way. Alright, let's get right into it. So this is uh, the Peregrine Hill Chardonnay 2008 uh, from Texas. Uh, again, hopefully I did my lighting correctly. I also did an adjustment on the camera. I had it in an indoor setting um, and it seemed like it was washing things to, out too much. I put on daylight setting because everything's so bright in here and it looks like the white balance is much better. Uh, so Peregrine Hill 2008 Chardonnay, this is from 
Texas. Nothing specific. Now, Peregrine Hill is made by uh, the fine folks at St. Genevieve Winery. Not the one in Missouri, but the one in Texas. Uh, Fort Stockton, Texas, to be, to be exact. Hopefully, I have a, a little map. Uh, popping up and uh, Fort Stockton, Texas is literally in the middle of nowhere. All right, it's close to it, uh, Big Bend National Park um, and by close I mean it looks like it's like a hundred miles away. <laughs> um, remember everything's big in Texas. So um, there's really not much information. I mean there's information but it's not like there's a website to go to where they talk about themselves. Um, there are some other companies, like there's a St. Genevieve Winery in Missouri, um, there's a Peregrine Hill Winery, uh, or wines, that's out of California, but um, as far as like website stuff, so um, I actually relied on uh, Russ's blog, uh, uh, dang it, the, uh, Vintage Texan, Let's see, it's a Vintage Texas, I'm sorry, Russ Kane, that's Russ's, right? Yeah, Russ. Sometimes I mix up who's got what blog in Texas. Uh, anyway, Russ Kane, uh, I went to his website. I'll put a link below to his. He's got some great stuff. I, I like to use his stuff a lot with um, uh, Texas information because he's, he's visited a lot of these places already. He already knows a lot. So I'm the new kid on the block. So I like to find my information out from people that have already done it. That's why you read the books, too. Anyway, um, uh, he got some information on there. They were originally... Uh, actually, if I remember co correctly, they were originally a University of Texas outfit. Um, let me... They may actually have another one. Let's quickly look that up. University of Texas Winery. And we're going to look at this real quick. Um, blah, blah, blah. Here, I'm just trying to find university. Yeah, okay, so they, I don't remember if, if they were started by UT, but uh, the UT system is the largest wine producer in the state with over 1,000 acres planted near Fort Stockton in West Texas. If you go to Vintage Texas, well not Vintage Texas, if you go to uh, the uh, gotexanwine.org, hmm, St. Genevieve Wines, Fort Stockton, Texas. From a thousand acre vineyard nestled among the high mazes of West Texas. So, yeah, this is the winery that uh, UT, at least at some point, had a hand in. Uh, I don't know if they still have any type of connection with it, but um, uh, they did have something to do with it. Uh, there was a French ownership of it for a while, and the two gentlemen, or the, the group that owns it right now, um, they, I think, worked for the French company at one point, or there was one did work for the, for the company, and I think the other one was. Uh, Associated with it was as in it was in the business, and they became partners and bought it a few years ago. All right, um, Peregrine Hill, from what I can tell, is their premium brand. Saint Genevieve is their entry level, um, and uh, apparently at some point in time, and this is probably why I haven't bought it. It doesn't have Texas on on the label as an appellation. Uh, now remember, just because it says Texas, I mean because it says Texas, the grapes can come from anywhere. Um, they have to have at least 75% of it to come from a specific, specific area, um, but they don't, actually, I think maybe this area it doesn't have an appellation. That might be why um, it just says Texas, and that I have to admit I should have known. Anyway, um, here we go, appellations. See, that's why I had the, I'm not doing the live streaming this time. No, Davis Mountain Viticultural Area. So, so there is. That's what I thought. There is. There is a. There is one in the area. All right. So, I just couldn't remember what it was called. Anyway, so the majority of the grapes did not come from that area, or if they did, they decided not to put the appellation on there. Don't know why, but um, anyway. So it comes from Texas as a Chardonnay, as you can tell. It's a very golden color. I mean, very, very gold. Um, hopefully you can see it really well on that uh, with all the lighting I've got now. And uh, I bought it at Specs for $9.29. So, um, which you've probably already seen in the lower third. Cause hopefully I didn't wait till now to do it. And um, let's go right at it. Very 
probably six minutes into it and finally starting to taste the wine. All right, well, um, I'm getting kind of a melony type of uh, cantaloupe type of stuff. A hint of that, almost apple-y on the nose. That's really about it. I mean, it is at 70 whatever degrees like it is in the house, so it's not been, it hasn't been cooled. So, um, I kind of get that, you know, I can, I can kind of get, I get a little bit of a burn in the nose. Uh, I want to say a cantaloupe rind. And I think that's been something that's been escaping me all this time with the cantaloupe smell. It's kind of like that rind uh, smell. Let's see how it tastes. Well, very low acid. Uh, really smooth. Um, especially considering it is at room temperature. Um, it doesn't really attack the palate too hard. Um, feels like, you know, there's, 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 a, there's a tad of sweetness to it. I'd say it has pretty much the same flavor profile as it does with the um, aromas. I don't get, I don't taste like cantaloupe rind, but it tastes more apple-like than cantaloupe-like. Um, pretty much just kind of a straight apple finish. I'm, I'm gonna guess it doesn't see any oak. I don't know. There's nothing on the back. Um, well, you know what? It does see oak because it says subtle oak characteristics, at attractive apple and tropical fruit. See, I was going to go tropical fruit, but I wasn't. But I, I, I sometimes go that direction and, and feel like maybe that's not quite right. But I, I do get that. Now that I think about it, there is some oakiness to it, but it's very subtle. Like I said. Uh, subtle. No, they did say subtle. It's not over the top. I don't feel like I'm eating a, a bag or, or a tub of buttered popcorn. Um, I don't feel like I have that buttery, nasty, oaky finish to it. So it, it's seen oak, and uh, it's not bad. I mean, I mean, it's a nine-dollar bottle of wine that's as good as any other nine-dollar bottle of Chardonnay out there you can buy from California or any other place in the world. Um, it's pretty darn decent and um, this is another thing I haven't decided I, over the past couple weeks since the last set of reviews you know I gave a lot of low scores and, and then as I revisited those wines I started thinking you know did this wine really deserve an 80 and did it or, or did this wine really deserve an 83 or 82 or 84 I mean I gave a lot of under 85 scores which usually is not good in the wine world and I and I'm struggling with whether or not I really want to continue with a point scoring system and rather just be like, I like the wine, I don't like the wine, I'd buy it again, I wouldn't buy it again for the price point, and, um, if, uh, and then do I think it's well made? Because bottom line, a score is kind of, I guess the score really is, is that, is, is the, the sum of all of those thoughts, but at the same time, sometimes it's so subjective. What, what I call an 88, somebody may call a 92, you know, and I guess what it is, I see all these wines get 90-something, 90 90-something, 90 and I've had the same wine, and I'm like, to me, a 90 needs to be pretty darn good, so I think what it is is I, I tend to score wines two to five points lower than I guess your typical critic does, because I guess in some ways I'm, I mean, I've done 200, and, this is 219 reviews, and I think by now I should be pretty solid in my scoring system and I feel like I'm all over the board on it. So I haven't decided if I really want to score this or not. I'm going to do one more taste. I think I'm going to do another set of scores and then we'll see how it goes.
I'm going to score it. And I'm going to score it an 86. Uh, I think it's pretty decent, pretty well made. Um, I think I probably would have scored an 82. Uh, but what I'm thinking is that I am scoring wines too low. Um, that these wines really are better than I, than I, I think what it is is I'm looking for, I think I'm looking for things that are 95 and above and when I don't reach that, then I'm scoring them a lot lower. Um, I'm not looking for them, but you know, I'm, I'm kind of assuming that wines won't be as good as they're supposed to be. It's a good wine. I like it. I like it a decent amount. Um, I still think 86 actually is too low. I'm going to go 88. 88 points. Because I have to think about it. I like the wine. I think it's a decent wine. It's well made. The oak isn't overpowering. Um, the the, the, the apple flavor, the citrus type, not citrus, but the I got the cantaloupe part out of it. And that's like tropical fruit, uh, like pineapple. Um, but the, the cantaloupe and the cantaloupe rind, I think it's really well made. Um, Acidity is really low. Um, now that's an indicator of a warmer climate white wine. Uh, low acidity because um, white, white grapes tend to do better in cooler climates. Um, and Fort Stockton is not cold. Now it gets cold in the wintertime. Man, it gets cold out there. But in the summertime, it's not cold. So um, I'm going to say that the, this is a pretty good wine. I'm going to give it an 88, not an 86. I'm going to press on with scoring, and I'm trying to make sure that I'm scoring wines a little bit better. I think, like I said, I think I score these wines two to five points lower than, than I normally would. And if I was going to give this kind of an 82, an 87, 88, I'm going to go with 88 because I really do like the wine. And I think I'm going to really enjoy this wine. Uh, a few days from now when I drink some more of it. Alright, so that said that didn't work. Not that I really want to hit the camera but since Gary doesn't do anything anymore no, that's that's the next one. Um, I figure I could steal his shtick every once in a while. Alright, so um, that's going to do it. Um, I've rambled long enough on here. It's a little bit longer than a 10 minute uh, video. So uh, actually, it's almost 50, 45. Yeah, way over 15, probably over five, 10 minutes. All right. So um, we're just so excited about the green screen and kind of think about that, give them my thoughts. Um, as always, stop by the website, leave some comments. I'm starting to get some comments because um, because I've been asking for them instead of just going hi, see you later. Stop by the website, leave some comments because um, that's the only way you're going to be able to do it. I mean, you might be sitting on your on your couch watching it via TiVo. Um, but, uh, you know, leave some comments. Uh, the, if you haven't friended me up yet, then uh, stop by, friend me up on Twitter, Facebook, anywhere else. Um, I've got my Flickr. I've got, man, I don't remember all the little things I got. I think I even have my Google Plus on there, which, unfortunately, I never use Google Plus. But um, let's, let's see. Let's see what, uh, let's see what all the little doodads I have up there. Because um, I don't even remember. Uh, Dig, Twitter, Stumble Upon, Facebook, YouTube, Flickr, LinkedIn. Oh yeah, my LinkedIn profile. Um, iTunes. That's so you can uh, find find it on iTunes if you want to do the podcast. I also have uh, iFood TV, which I've been really slacking and sending them stuff, and that really has to do. I'm going to rant for just a little bit. That has to do with Tube Mogul. Um, it's not their fault necessarily. But they did up my limit to 500 megabytes, which was so very, very cool. But now my, my almost my minimum is 500 megabytes, and I can't upload to them anymore um, without paying an, an extraordinary amount of money per month. I'm not going to give you hundreds of dollars a month to upload my video so you can distribute it to two or three different places. The, the point of those things is so that I don't have to, one, kill my bandwidth um, with uploading 500, 600, 900 megabyte files um, and taking forever to do it because I got to do it. I mean, I can do it all at the same time, but it's just a real pain where I can upload to one place or a couple places and go distribute it to everywhere else. And that's what blip.tv does for me. I'm a little disappointed with them too. They're going to stop doing Vimeo uh, in another couple months. Uh, the other things that they're going to stop distributing to, I'm not really, I don't really care about. Um, I, I just signed up for everything I could get on, but I really don't get any views on, on Vizio TV or any of the other ones. Um, but they're at least keeping Roku. Um, 
they don't really have a TiVo, they, they have a TiVo agreement, but they don't, but TiVo actually subscribes to my RSS feed, which is perfect, except sometimes, so, oh, that's another thing. If you notice that there's a skip in the, in the series, in the episode numbers, then you need to come by the website and watch that video, because for some reason, the TiVo, TiVo did not pick up that video on the RSS feed. Um, it's there. Um, but there's some weird thing about the order of videos and the format, but I don't change anything. So why it doesn't pick up every single time, I don't know. So if you, if you're, there, there are missing episodes, which there are, there are quite a few missing ones on TiVo, come by the website, just, you know, look between the episodes. So if there's a skip, it wasn't because I didn't send it to TiVo, it's that the RSS feed didn't pick it up, or they didn't pick up on the RSS feed. Anyway, um, you can also subscribe to the RSS feed, which I think it's on there too. But um, anyway, so they're gonna they they're gonna stop the TiVo support, but I didn't really worry about that because, like I said, it's the feed. Um, they're keeping Roku, which I'm getting a few people on Roku. If you know other people, or if you have a Roku box and you're watching this on your computer and you want to sit on your couch, I don't know how you find it on Roku, but it is there. Um, I know the views are there. I've actually had people tell me they've they've seen it. So you got that, and uh, so stop by, click on the links up there, uh, click on the links below for uh, Russ's website, um, I'll even put the Go Text and Wine website on there, why the heck not, um, so you can kind of see what the, what the state does to promote the wine stuff, um, there's, no, there's no website for this, for this wine, and uh, donate, click, click the donate button. Um, it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing as far as what's written there, but uh, in all seriousness, um, I accept any donations. Or if you're a winery, you want to send me wine. Whether you want to do a, a Skype interview or not, which I'm about, I have a Skype interview lining up, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Um, I already got the wine, we just got to coordinate the, the schedule. But uh, anyway, if you want to donate, click on the button. You can do a one-time donation, you can do a monthly donation. Um, it's kind of tongue in cheek about you know thirteen thirty seven being you know standalone executive producer credit, dude. If you do, if you donate ten bucks, you'll get a producer credit, executive producer. Okay, um, let's see, that's gonna do it. We'll see everyone again next time. <laughs>